بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وجدنا علما وعملا وهدى وتقى ورشادا برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد طيب الحمد لله last week we had finished uh, three of the ayahs of Surah Al-Fatiha let's take a just uh, let's, let's just take a quick review of those uh, ayahs Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen uh, what did we discuss uh, regarding the meaning of Alhamd is it uh, mere praise or is there something additional to praise in Alhamd Naam, uh, I feel uh, praise with love. And? Uh, praise with love and? Uh, veneration? Uh, yeah, ahsan, ahsan. Praise with love and veneration. Mumtaz. Mumtaz. Praise with respect. Mumtaz. Barakallahu feekum. So, hamd is not madh. Madh is mere praise. But uh, hamd is a praise that is accompanied with, with love, uh, affection, and uh, veneration. بارك الله فيكم ممتاز طيب لله رب العالمين what did we uh, uh, mention about the root or origin of لفظ الجلالة الله what is its origin and what does it mean uh, it comes from الإله ممتاز and الإله means uh, the, the, the deity uh, the worship one okay mumtaz allah barik fik tayyib lillahi rabbil alamin rabb what is the meaning of rabb rabbil alamin rabb caretaker caretaker nurturer tayyib and we said that rububiyya yani includes uh, four things uh, amongst which are yani al khalq wal mulk wal tadbir wal uh, uh, it includes uh, creation and the ownership and control of everything in the universe and uh, sustenance. sustenance so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, the owner, the uh, disposer of all affairs of the universe and <coughs> he is the uh, uh, sustainer of all of his all, all of the creation طيب, uh, also uh, in Rabb, uh, we said that it, it comes from tarbiya, which is to nurture and to care, uh, take care of something or someone. And uh, uh, we also had addressed this issue that Rabb, uh, tarbiya, even though its root is Rabaya, however, yani, uh, Rabb is still uh, similar to it in meaning. Yani, even though Rabb, tarbiya it comes from Rabaya, and Rabb comes from Ra, Ba, and Ba. But their meanings are similar, but their meanings are similar, which is why and some of the Arabs used to say, an yarubbani rajulun min Quraysh ahabbu ilayya aur khayrun min an yarubbani rajulun min Hawazin. That a, a, a person from Quraysh uh, t- takes care of me and nurtures me, is more beloved to me, or it's better than uh, that uh, if, if a person from Hawazin, another يعني, of the يعني, tribes, uh, يعني, um, uh, takes care of me and nurtures me. So he used the word Rabba Ya Rubbu in the meaning of Tarbiya. So uh, this uh, this issue is also addressed uh, in this way. Type Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Alameen. How did we translate Alameen and what is the meaning of Alameen? Naam, quickly, quickly, inshallah. Ahmad, Akhi Afaq, Fahmi Nasir, Ahmad Khan, and anyone. It's a lord of all the words, uh, worlds, you said? Worlds, okay. What is the meaning of worlds? Yani, what, what do we mean by words? Lord of the worlds, Taib, Rabbil Alameen. Insan, or Nabatat, Muslim, or Hewanat, or Fimadaniyat. Fantastic. Yani, all of, all the different all types of creation. All the different types of creation. Taib. Uh, Shift, what about the stars? Stars are also included in this? Yes, yes, of course. All, all different types of creation is called the world, the world of stars. Alamul and Nujum, 
او عالم يا yeah, عالم النجوم يس yes. عالم الملائكه عالم الجمادات عالم يعني all different types of creation are called عالم each type of creation is called عالم بارك الله فيك طيب uh, الرحمن الرحيم what was the difference between الرحمن الرحيم that we had mentioned الرحمن <laughs> uh, نعم يا اخي نعم رحمان the attribute of Allah's mercy while Rahim is the mercy that reaches his creation ممتاز جدا يعني رحمان is within Allah, within Allah's self يعني you, when you when you when you use the word الرحمن it is a, a an individual attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without without looking towards the object both of them are uh, يعني both of them uh, يعني denote the intensity Uh, of uh, uh, mercy uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rahman and Rahim both. But Rahim refers to yani, the Rahma, the mercy reaching the creation. And Rahman refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being full of mercy uh, himself. Wadah, mumtaz jiddan. Jazakallah khair. Can we say the quality and the characteristic of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, wallahi, I don't really know the difference between quality and characteristic. Both seem similar to me. Yes, for, um, for for all these names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, ninety nine names. No, for the uh, for all of these names, uh, yes, we yeah. we do use the word characteristics. Quality, yes. I have I haven't found anyone use the word qualities, but characteristics is used now by ulama. Okay. Maliki okay. Why was uh, يعني, why is the mulk of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala was restricted to Yom al-Din in this ayah? Why specifically or uh, Yom al-Din? Because. Uh, He's the owner and the king of the day of judgment alone. Because in the in the world there are many type of kings. There is the Allah has given the power in the in the world. He has given the power that you are the owner of this. But at the Yom Din there will be no nobody owner. Only Allah will be there. Mumtaz, okay. Yani Allah Subhanahu wa Taala alone will be uh, the owner of everything on the Yom Din. Uh, in uh, in this world there is relative ownership. That is that has been given by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Himself, but there is relative ownership in this world. On Yom Al Din, on the Yom on Yom Al Qiyamah, there will be no owner other than Allah. Liman Al Mulk Al Yom, for whom is the kingdom today? Lillahi Al Wahid Al Qahar. Lillahi Al Wahid Al Qahar for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala alone. Okay. Um, okay. Yom Al Din. Why Din? Yom Al Qiyamah. Why is it called Yom Al Din? Jaza. Jaza. Uh, نعم. Because the Deen means Jaza. ممتاز. Deen means Jaza. And it says uh, it said in Arabic, كما يدين الفتى يدان. The way he treats others, he is treated. يعني the way he conducts himself, he, he, that is the way he will be rewarded for it. طيب. كما يدين الفتى يدان. ممتاز جدا. طيب. مالك يوم الدين. نبدأ الآن. بسم الله. طيب. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. طيب. There is something noticeable here. Since the beginning of the surah, the pronouns that were being used or the way we were يعني, saying this dua, we were praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a third person, using the third person pronouns or the third person form of, uh, يعني, uh, the, that's the form we were using in our sentences. So we said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So as if we are talking about a third person, right? Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawm din Suddenly, we shift from third person form to second person form and we start saying, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. See, since the beginning of the surah, we, we were not saying, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We did not say, we, don't, we did not address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We did not say, uh, uh, all praises to, for you, O Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yom We said Alhamdulillah as if we're talking about a third person right? or uh, using third person form. Suddenly we shift to second person form. Iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in. What uh, is the secret behind this? How, why are we shifting suddenly to second person form uh, uh, in your opinion? Ya ikhwan wa akhawat. Because we are now directly uh, asking Allah, direct love, we are direct to Allah. That's why it is said that um, Surah Fatiha is that you ask and then Allah gives. So we are directly asking to that. Now third part, yeah. third one is has come to this, the direct person. We are directly asking to Allah. Why in the first place 
why were we yani, uh, okay then why were we using third person form uh, in the first three sentences is because in the of, first in the first one it uh, he introduced himself no no you are the one saying in the in the salah alhamdulillah rabbil alamin ar rahman ar rahim malik yawm ad-din yani you are the one who you are who's being taught to say this in the salah naam ya ikhwan because you are praising allah in the first three ayahs Okay, you're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first three ayahs. You can, pray, you can praise him uh, by saying, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. All praises for you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. That's the same thing, isn't it? First we praise Allah, then we ask. That, that is cool. That, that is okay. That, that's fine. See, the thing is, why this shift? Why don't we just say, Iyahu na'bud wa iyahu nasta'in. It is he whom we worship. It is he whom we yani, seek help from. Why did we shift yani, from... Uh, third person form to second person that that is the question this shift yani why why doesn't it yani remain constant and if you start with second person khalas alhamdulillah ya rabbal alamin anta ar rahman ar rahim malik malik yawm ad din wa iyyaka na'bud ma fi shikal alhamdulillah rabbil alamin ar rahman ar rahim malik yawm ad din iyyahu na'bud wa iyyahu nasta'in third person keep it that way why is this shift yani this this shift has some faida it certainly has some faida What is this faida? Why are we shifting to second person form? Or second person, uh, whatever it's called in grammar. Uh, yeah. Is it to show like the closeness of Allah that uh, it, uh, the same thing happened in Surah Al-Baqarah in some ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah also? Allahu Akbar, yeah. mumtaz, jiddan, yeah. jiddan mumtaz. Mumtaz jiddan. It, it is a dua that we are asking directly. Okay, and dua is supposed to be, uh, yani done, oh, okay. and you you express closeness to allah when you're making a dua that is possible as well but uh, what taha said he said because uh, what did you say taha again yeah uh, i said that uh, for the closeness of allah because in the surah bakra also that happens that uh, when it's a dua is like uh, when they ask you uh, that I, it's like uh, it's mentioned to prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but then it shifted to then say i'm in i'm near to them or something like that. Uh, yeah. uh, that, that, that okay, Mumtaz. okay, so th- it's related to the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, there are two fawa'il, there are, there, are, there are two benefits of this. First is the benefit when you change this, when you make this shift, it, it grasps and grabs the attention of the listener. Now, yani, I, if I start, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman, Rahim, Malik, Yom, then خلص, after three ayahs, I'm fine. Khalas is talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fine. But suddenly when you shift from third person form to second person, خلص, I'm, it suddenly grabs my attention. Okay, what is going on here? Yani why the shift? So the first faida, this, this concept in uh, ilm al-balagha, this concept in balagha is called iltifat. This concept in balagha is called iltifat. Iltifat means to move, uh, your, yani, to move towards uh, something or to move away from something. So you move from the pronouns for the third person to the pronouns for the second person. So this is, this is called iltifat in balagha. So it's the first faida, and this is a constant faida. This, is, yani this faida or this benefit is uh, constant in all of the places where iltifat is used. That it grabs the attention of the, of the, of the listener. The second faida or second uh, benefit is related to the meaning, and that depends on the context. Yani in, in different contexts, you have different yani, uh, fawaid that, that, that are related to meanings. So at times you do iltifat because it's something um, evil and you don't want to yani, attribute it to yourself. So for example, yani, there is this, uh, uh, the, the, qissa, the, the story of Abu Talib uh, when he died. Uh, so the, the narrator, uh, Al-Musayyib, uh, he said at the end of the story, he said that Abu Talib Uh, when he died, he said, he, 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 what, what had Abu Talib actually said? He had said, ala, uh, ana ala millati Abdul Muttalib. I'm upon the fate of Abdul Muttalib. He said, I am upon the fate of Abdul, Abdul Muttalib. However, the narrator, when he narrates this story, he says, qala huwa ala millati Abdul Muttalib. He said, he said, yani Abu Talib said, and then he does not use the, the pronoun I. He uses the pronoun, he said, he is upon the faith of Abdul Muttalib. So that, yani, uh, he does not attribute uh, this pronoun, or it doesn't seem that he is the one who is saying it, because it's, so, it's something so evil, he does not want it attributed to himself. 
even though the listener would have understood that طبعاً, he does not want that. He wants, he wants, he, he's only uh, narrating to us what Abdul, Abdul, Abu Talib had said. But even then, he wants to avoid this. So he says, قَالَ هُوَ عَلَى مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ He said, he is upon the, the faith of Abdul Muttalib. So iltifat has different يعني, أغراض. It has different purposes, different objectives. So this objective that is يعني, uh, to uh, grab the attention of the listener, this is يعني, a constant uh, objective in most places it is there. The second objective or the second purpose of using iltifat depends on the context. Here, <coughs> the ulama have mentioned that when the slave praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he, when he glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has drawn closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has become closer to Allah after having praised him and glorified him. And now it is more suitable to shift to the second person uh, form because now he is close to Allah. So now he is addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. So this is the, يعني, the secret or the sir that the ulama have mentioned with regards to the iltifa that occurs in iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. And other one is like mentioned by some of the brothers and sisters that يعني, when, when you start a dua, khalas, you want to you want to express closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, it is more suitable to, uh, to behave as if you are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that, just like when you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, it is, um, يعني, uh, you are more hopeful of your dua being accepted and being responded to. Likewise, when you address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, it has a, an, an element of husnul dhan. It has an element of husnul dhan, يعني, having good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that He is going to respond to your prayer. So much that you're so confident that you are addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly that you're addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly and that there is no barrier between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can address him directly. There is no barrier between you and him uh, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can address him directly. So this is the other fa'ida of iltifat here because now you are starting dua. Uh, so uh, uh, yani you, shift from, you shift to second person form to express your closeness to Allah and that there is no barrier between you and him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. Okay. طيب. What is the difference between نعبدك and إياك نعبد? Why didn't, why doesn't the ayah say نعبدك and instead says إياك نعبد? There is some something in Arabic grammar that when you say iyaka, it gives more power, the more more strength when you say iyaka. And now, if you say only nastiyanoka, though it will not be like that way unless you say okay. iyaka. You are close, but strength or power is not the right word here. Yani, yes, yes, I know. Right. It's not the right word. Yeah. There's a meaning of hustle there. Confined. Confined. We was meaning of hustle. Okay, Exclusive. exclusively, Mumtaz. Yani, when you say that it is you whom I worship, there's a difference between saying it is you who I'm, whom I worship and between saying I worship you. But if you say I worship you, then yani, it is possible that you worship others as well. But when you say it is you whom I worship, like in Arabic, if you say, for example, yani, Zaydan darabtu. it is Zayd whom I beat, طيب? it's Zayd whom I hit. That means it's only him that you hit, and you did not hit anyone else. But if he says, Darab to Zayd, then I hit Zayd. Okay, yeah, you might have hit other people as well. So when you mention the object, yani the object by object, I mean the, the, the grammatical object. So we have a verb, and then verb has an object, yeah? So if you, we mention the object before the verb, it indicates that the action is restricted to that one object. Yani it's confined in that one object, it did not uh, apply on other objects. There weren't no objects. This is grammatically speaking, because I, I, I don't like to use the word object for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just grammatically speaking, this is the rule that when you mention the object before the verb, 
it confines and restricts the work to that object, right? So it is the ball that I hit, for example. I, I, I did not hit anything but the ball, okay? So this, this is how iyaka na'bud means that it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we worship. That is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we, that we worship. وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And it is only Him that we seek uh, help from. طيب. We'll come to Nasta'in later. Before that, uh, what is the meaning of ibadah? And when you say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ What is ibadah? What is the essence of ibadah? Okay, the, the, the simplest meaning of ibadah. Obey, obedience. Obedience. Okay, this is one of the things that are included in ibadah obedience there's yes. another thing this is and humbleness tadallul and khudur and humbleness yani to humility to, to humble yourself before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bow down before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huh? this is the main uh, yani element of ibadah in ibadah that is khudu and tadallul yani to humble yourself to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mumtaz iyyaka na'bud wa iyyaka nasta'in tayyib Ibadah or ubudiyah. Ibadah, you need to worship Allah and to be a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the most honorable rank a human can achieve. Yani the most honorable rank for humans in, yani in this life and in the, in, in the hereafter is to be said that he is the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Abdullah. And which is why you would notice in the Quran that in the places where, yani, which which is yani, or in the uh, maqamat where, where the Prophet ﷺ is being mentioned in the most honorable of yani, uh, contexts. Yani, uh, for example, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealing the Quran to him. What does Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says? Alhamdulillah, alladhi nazzala ala abdihi al كتابة صح الحمد لله الذي نزل على أنزل الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتابة so when when you, when you're saying that uh, when when Allah سبحانه is saying that he has revealed the book to the messenger revelation is the most honorable thing يعني you have been chosen by Allah سبحانه وتعالى out of all of the people to deliver the message of Allah سبحانه وتعالى you have been entrusted with this responsibility of delivering the message on behalf of Allah سبحانه وتعالى to all of the people. There is no honor greater than this. What is the, what is the attribute that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this particular context? He says, Alhamdulillah ladhi anzala ala abdihi. Alhamdulillah ladhi anzala ala abdihi al kitaba Upon his slave. So in the most honorable of places, this attribute is used that he is the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise in other places like uh, in Surah Al-Furqan, let's say. In Surah Al-Furqan, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْفُرْقَانَ عَلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ لِيَكُونَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ نَذِيرًا And blessed is the one who uh, revealed the Furqan upon his slave. Upon his slave. وَأَنَّهُ لَمَّا uh, And also, any re revelation, usually it's used in the context of revelation in the Qur'an. Also, it's used in uh, Surah Al-Jinn. Allahu uh, A'lam. وَأَنَّهُ لَمَّا قَامَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ يَدْعُوهُ كَادُوا يَكُونُونَ عَلَيْهِ لِبَدَا And when the servant and slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stood invoking him. يعني, now, again, when he's, when he's invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the most honorable of maqamat, Allah is using the same attribute, Abdullahi, the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was to, to, to uh, yani, uh, establish and prove that the servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his slavery is from the most honorable of ranks that a human can achieve. <clears throat> now, the question arises that why uh, isn't يعني, uh, being free يعني, or not being a slave to anyone? Why isn't this more honorable? يعني, why, is it, يعني, why is it that you have to be a slave to achieve an honorable rank? يعني, why isn't it that to say that uh, a human being is not a slave to anyone uh, more honorable than, slaying that he's a, that he's a, than saying that he's a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yani, why isn't 
saying that a free human is more honorable than uh, the one who is slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it so? Why are we saying that this is the most, the highest honor that a, that a human can get to? Why isn't freedom the highest honor that you can achieve? I, I am just thinking that it is because the Huzur Sallallahu is the highest person in the world. No, no, no. We're talking so about it all, is of, linked all of to the, we're talking about all of the all, yeah, humans, all of the humans, all of the humans. Yeah, all of the humans. All of the humans. Is it not that the Huzur Sallallahu Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the highest ranked person in the human being? And it is, it is. We are generally speaking that Abdullah or being a slave to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the greatest honor and the highest honor that a human can uh, attain and uh, achieve. So why isn't freedom the highest honor? That's the question. Yani logically speaking, or many freedom is considered higher than being a slave to anyone. That is because, firstly, you cannot Escape the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can you be free? You cannot be free. This is impossible. Secondly, even in this dunya, those people who think, who, who are, who think that they are free and they call for yani, freedom, they are actually, in reality, they are a slave to their own desires. So a human being is always a slave to something. Be it, and it could be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it could be his own desires, it could be some other god, it could be some uh, other ideology, but he's always a slave to something. So the one who thinks that he is free, he's not actually free, he's actually a slave to his own desires. أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنْ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَا Tell me about the person who has taken his own desires as his ma'bud, as, as a deity, as a, as a god that he worships. He worships his own desires. So there is nothing like absolute, there is nothing like freedom for a human being. So you're either Abdullah or you're either Abdul Dirham of Dinar. Huh? You are the slave of uh, Dirham and Dinar. Or you are the slave of your own desires, you are Abdul Hawa, or you are Abdul Mathalan, any other deity. Yeah? But you cannot escape slavery. So the greatest slavery is of the greatest being, and that is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, for example, in this dunya, any person who works for a, uh, let's say, a a person who uh, yani works uh, for, for, let's say, a middle class man uh, and a person who works for a king. It, even if they have the same jobs, a secretary, let's say, who helps a king and a secretary who hel helps a, a, a normal manager in a, in, a, in a normal company, both of them might have the same job, but the first, uh, the, the, the secretary to the king would feel more honored because he is the Yani, uh, secretary to the king. Yani, خلص, his, now his honor is attached to that of the king. So likewise, you are going to be a slave, no matter what. You are going to remain a slave. So the greatest honor that you can achieve is that of being a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is, uh, is, uh, is that of being a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope that is clear, inshallah. Is that clear, inshallah? Mashallah, mashallah, it is very clear and it is very new theory for me. Barakallah feekum, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah, jazakallah. Uh, okay. And now coming on to what Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds when a person says in salah, Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. Anyone uh, uh, remembers the hadith that when a person says, Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in response to it? It is between me and my servant, my slave. It is between me and my slave, and my slave can get whatever he asks for. 
okay, now what is the relation between this response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and between the rank of ubudiyah, the rank of servitude and slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I want you to يعني, uh, uh, strike a relation between ubudiyah, between slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and between the closeness to Allah and the probability of your dua being accepted. See, when you said, na'bud, it is you that we worship, and you expressed this slavery and servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, Wali ma sa'al, and my slave can get what he asks for. طيب. This teaches us that the more you increase in your ubudiyah, the greater a slave to Allah you are, the closer you become to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greater the way in which you express your servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the greater your khudur and your humility for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the greater is the chance of your dua being accepted. Which is why the Prophet said, Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu wa huwa sajid. Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu ila wa huwa sajid. The closest a slave is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when he is in sujood. Is when he is in sujood because this is the height of ubudiyah. There is the, this is the height of khudur. This is the height of humility for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wadih. And this is the, the, the greatest one humbles himself towards Allah. He puts his head, his head, his forehead, his forehead, which is considered the yani, most honorable of the body parts. Uh, this is the most honorable uh, and most honored of the body parts. His face and his head, his forehead. He puts it on the ground for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He puts it on the ground and humbles himself and his face. He puts it on the ground for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is when he becomes the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence, when one becomes closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he advise? He said, fihi min dua So do lots of dua in sujood. So do dua, so do lots of dua in sujood. فَأَكْثِرُ فِيهِ مِنَ الدُّعَاء This, all of this, يعني, taking this ayah and this hadith into consideration, we learned that if you want to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if you want your duas to be accepted, you should increase your ubudiyah. You should increase your humbleness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your khudur for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how to increase that? By يعني, increasing the acts of worship that you perform, doing lots of salah. And most importantly is to, to concentrate and focus in the ibadah that you are doing. So when you feel this meaning, this, this ma'na that you are placing your forehead on the ground humbling yourself toward, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking his uh, reward, seeking his mercy. This is when you will achieve this closeness. Else, if you do not feel this, and your salah becomes a mere set of actions that you quickly carry out and then يعني, get done with the salah, then your salah is void of this ubudiyah that we are seeking. It will be void of this closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will result in your dua being accepted and all your matters being uh, solved. Once you become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can leave all your matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything becomes easy for you. Everything comes into place. Your matters might be cluttered and scattered all over the place. But when you gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Allah is by your side, khalas, 
then all your matters come into place, the, everything is organized, you, your priorities become, uh, uh, come into place, and you are يعني, free of any worries and any sadness and sorrows because now you have left your matters with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the sort of meaning and the feeling that we should try to achieve in our salah. And in, in, in particular in the sujood and ruku'ah. And when reading Fatiha, imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Yani, if we talk about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, we, we would, yani, uh, yani, we die and uh, yani, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yani, all of the, yani, if the seas were the ink and the, uh, yani, uh, and the trees, all of the trees were the pens, yani, uh, yani, these would finish, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalimat and his praises would not end. Despite all of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to you. You, a faqir and a haqir, yani a lowly creation, who is in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's responding to you. And he says, when you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, he says, Hamidani Abdi, my slave has praised me. And he then, when you say, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, he responds to you. So imagine. Athna alayya abdi. My slave has praised me again. When you say Malik Yomuddin, he says, Majjadani abdi. He says, My slave has glorified me. Subhanallah. Allah is responding to you from above the seven heavens. Allah, the greatest. If, if one of the kings of the dunya mentions your name or responds to you directly, you feel so honored. Oh, today I received an email from so and so. I received an email from so and so. I received a call from so and so. Uh, I have direct contact with so-and-so. All of this is something that you feel honored with. Allah from above the seven heavens, the Lord of the worlds, is responding to you. And when you say, He says, This is between me and my slave. And for my slave is what he asks for. If, such an if you have such an opportunity, it is unimaginable how a person would not be attentive in his salah if the Lord of the world is responding to his call and responding to his praises. Subhanallah. Yani a king is, is calling you and you're not picking up the phone. Yeah? Now is your opportunity. So you say, Then you ask, for يعني, hidayah until the end of the يعني, under the end of the dua. So this is something that we must keep in our mind and must uh, يعني, uh, try to feel in our salah and in our sujood that we are the closest to Allah and we ask we will get whatever we ask for. But what is required of us is to be sincere and mukhlis and attentive in our ibadah and focus in our in our ibadah. We must have khushu in our, iba in our ibadah. Naam. Taib. Coming on to wa iyyaka nasta'een al isti'ana. What is the meaning of isti'ana? To seek help. To seek help. Taib. Uh, what, is, what is the root of isti'ana? What is it derived from? Isti'ana. Uh, yeah. Istaana is derived from Aun, and Aun means help. Then what does Alif Sin Ta mean? Remember, anyone remembers what is the meaning of Alif Sin and Ta? Seeking. Seeking. Alif Sin Ta is always seeking. So when you say, for example, uh, or it's mostly, it refers to seeking and asking for something. So Istaana, yani asking for Allah's Aun. طيب. And we mentioned something before this as well. I am not, I'm forgetting, uh, there was one example that uh, isti'adha, yeah, when we were talking about isti'adha, so isti'adha was yani, seeking Allah's awd, and awd is refuge. Here, seeking Allah's awn, and that is the help. Right? Isti'adha means to seek Allah's help. So, alif sinta usually refers to seeking. 
usually refers to seeking and asking. Tayyib? Okay. Asta'ana, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay. Uh, usually when you ask someone for any help, you, uh, يعني, you ask for help in, uh, uh, يعني, for something particular, صح? يعني, uh, uh, let's say if I'm asking, uh, uh, يعني, let's say one of the, uh, my brothers for help, I'm saying, hey, أخي, help me with uh, fixing this. Here, you're saying, and it is you that whose help we seek. But we did not mention what is that thing in which we seek Allah's help. What do we seek Allah's help for? So what is the fa'ida or what is the benefit that we gain from uh, يعني, omitting the second object? يعني, when you seek someone's help, so see when you use the word isti'ana, isti'ana, مثلاً, Muhammadun, Muhammad has sought help. Isti'ana uh, Muhammadun, مثلاً, bi Ahmad. He sought Ahmad's help. على, uh, مثلاً, على ال, على for studies, for study. So he is seeking someone's help for something. Here we are saying, We seek your help, but we are not mentioning for what. We are not mentioning this part. And we are seeking help for what. So why is it omitted? And what is the fa'idah that we gain by omitting uh, this second part. Uh, I think, Sheikh, sure, when we say "iyyaka uh, nasta'in," uh, it's like uh, it's a gen it's like in general we are asking Allah. Yeah, it, 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 the fact that we gain from this is the umum that generally for everything. We're asking your help for everything. This is the fire that you gain by includes everything we do, like your sister says, includes everything that we that we do. We are asking for Allah's help in everything. So when you don't mention the second object, here, then this becomes am. The isti'ana becomes generic. So it includes, it becomes inclusive of everything that you would need help for. So this is the fa'idah of, of omitting the second object. You're not mentioning what you're seeking Allah's help for. But the context, in this context, What is that one thing that you surely need Allah's help for? Uh, uh, staying in the, uh, looking at the context of this ayah. What is that one thing that you surely are asking Allah's help for? Guidance. For guidance, okay, mumtaz, for guidance and for ibadah. So we do worship you, O oh Allah, but that worship is by your tawfiq. Even for that worship that we are doing and we are attributing that, that action to ourselves, even for that action, we need and seek your help. We need and seek your help. Wadah, ya ikhwan? Mumtaz, time. Uh, okay, uh, it says here, وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ طيب, uh, don't we seek anyone else's help in the world, يعني in, in our lives? Don't we seek uh, help of our friends? Don't we seek help of our relatives? Well, here it says, only you, is only you that we seek uh, help from. Now, see, isti'ana is of two types. There is this isti'ana, and this has been mentioned by Shaykh Mawthaymeen, rahmatullahi alayhi, isti'ana of tafweed. Isti'ana to tafweed. Tayyib. Isti'ana to tafweed means when you're seeking help, you are yani, totally depending on the one whose help you're seeking. This is isti'ana to tafweed. Tafweed means to leave your matters and يعني, to, to leave your matters with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are, يعني, like when we say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. That I cannot change anything, I don't have any strength, except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a sort of isti'ana that is meant here. That it is only through your help that I can do anything. 
Such an isti'ana is exclusive for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which you leave the, all, all of the matters to Allah. You say, all of the things are in your hand, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's your help that I want. No, I cannot, of my own self, I cannot do anything, and neither can anyone else help me. It is only your help that I'm seeking. Such an isti'ana, this type of isti'ana is exclusive to Allah. And then we have isti'anatul musharaka. Isti'anatul musharaka. And this isti'ana is related to yani, the isti'ana of the dunya in, uh, in which we seek uh, the help of others uh, uh, in, in the means to do something, in the means to achieve something. So this is done in the asbab, in the world of asbab. Fi alam al asbab. This is done in the alam of asbab. Okay, in the world of the means of the asbab, this is the sort of isti'ana that you seek. This is not isti'ana al tafwil. However, isti'ana al musharaka itself, if it is done for your own personal interests, it is makruh, it is discouraged, not recommended to be sought. Which is why the Prophet وسلم, always said, he said to Ibn Abbas, and if you ask someone's help, ask Allah's help. طيب. And uh, he had taken uh, uh, a pledge uh, from some of, some of the Sahaba, some particular Sahaba, that they would not ask anyone for anything. They would not ask the people for anything. So even if someone was riding his camel and if his whip used to fall off the camel, he would himself descend and take it, uh, yani pick it up instead of asking uh, a passerby to give it to him. Why? Because he had made this pledge to Rasulullah that he would not ask anyone for, for any help. Okay, why did the Prophet وسلم, yani, uh, teach this to some of the, yani, or take a pledge from some of the Sahaba uh, instead of others? Because yani, they had this himma, this determination to abide by this pledge and to stay true to it. While others, the Prophet ﷺ only advised them. So he advises Ibn Abbas, And he advises, advises yeah, he generally advises that even if your shoe string, uh, if you, even if you're asking for a shoe string, then ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this to nurture tawheed. To nurture tawheed in the hearts of the slaves, in the hearts of the believers. Wadah. Because even in this dunya, if you, are, if you uh, avoid asking anyone other than Allah, then your tawheed, yani, it reaches a level uh, yani, uh, that is greater than if you were used to asking other people for things in this dunya. What happens is when you ask for things, uh, when you ask someone else uh, yani, in the dunya, uh, when you ask uh, someone for something, uh, the natural reaction to that is that your heart becomes attached to that person. Your heart becomes attached to that person. And when the heart becomes muta'alliq, and this is ta'alluq al-qalb, this is very important. Your heart should at all times be attached only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when you become too used to asking others for your needs and for your yani, hawaij, then your heart becomes attached to the means instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence you become weak in tawheed. Because your heart is always attached to the means and not to the creator of those means. But when you avoid and abstain from asking anyone else, your heart only becomes attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And your heart only makes a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, it becomes free of any ta'alluq, any attachment to ghayrullah ta'ala. And hence your tawheed becomes strong. Wadah. So this is the hikmah uh, when, uh, behind or uh, uh, only seeking help from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in your worldly matters, even in alam al-asbab. Okay. And finally, uh, just a quick question. What is the يعني, munasaba, what is the relation of sti'ana in this context? Uh, يعني, what is the relation of sti'ana to what comes after it? If someone had already answered this question because we, were, يعني, we are seeking hidayah, we are seeking dua. So يعني, you were mentioning this is يعني, a suitable thing to mention before asking uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything. So when you're asking Allah for hidayah, you, it was suitable to mention that it's only you, it is only Allah that we depend on 
for any help. Uh, try to, inshallah, I'll try to finish this quickly. If I couldn't write the notes in English, uh, I was too busy يعني, studying uh, it in Arabic, so I just wrote it in, uh, the notes down in Arabic. So, and I, inshallah, try my best to explain it to you guys. Okay. Um, what is the meaning of Hidayah? Guidance. Guidance, type. Uh, okay. Well, in English, when you say uh, someone guided me, do you use the uh, the preposition to? You, don't you use the preposition to? You say, uh, yani for example, Uthman uh, guided me to the shop. So, how Use the preposition to. Right or wrong? Yes. In Arabic also at times we use فَهَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا اخْتُلِفَ فِيهِ مِنَ الْحَقِّ بِإِذْنِهِ Or يعني وَاللَّهُ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ صُرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يعني guides whomever he wills towards to إلى صُرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ To the يعني right and the straight path Here we don't have any إلى We don't have any إلى here we did not say ihdina ila sirat al mustaqim. We said ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Is this يعني, something that you have observed? يعني, this is noticeable that here we not, we're not using the preposition ila. We're not saying ihdina ila sirat al mustaqim. We're saying ihdina sirat al mustaqim. What is the fa'ida? What is this? Uh, يعني, what is the benefit that we gain from this? That the sort of hidayah that you are asking for is the hidayah of tawfiq. That, oh Allah, show me the right path and make me walk on the right path. Make me take that path. Put me, put me on that path. al mustaqim. You're not just asking Allah to show you that path, rather, you're also asking Allah to put you on that path. Wadah. So this is why, this is one of the reasons that ilah has been omitted. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim not just guide me, rather put me on that path as well. Don't just show it to me, show it to me and put me on that, on that path. Time. as sirat Okay, what is the meaning of sirat? Path. Path. Time. Okay, uh, what, is, what else do we use for a, for a path? What, what other word do we use for a, for a path? Road. No, 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 okay. in, in Arabic. In Arabic. Asabil, Mumtaz, Asabil, and Tariq, and Sarat. Okay. But uh, we had mentioned this qa'ida at the beginning, or in the few, first few rules of Tasid, that in Arabic there's nothing mutaradif. There is nothing that is completely synonymous to uh, another word. There is no word that is completely synonymous to another word. There must be some difference. And this might be true for other languages as well, but in Arabic, this is the principle. This is a qaida. There is no word that is synonymous completely to another word. طيب? So, sarat must have something that is additional to tariq. Yani it must have something that distinguishes it from tariq. What is that? What are, what are those things? Sarat, firstly, linguistically or in, in, yani in lugha, it refers to al as easy swallow of something. To swallow something easy is sarata, easily. Tayyip? Sarata, I need to swallow something easily. Tayyip? So, hence we have this meaning of ease that is uh, يعني, exclusive to sarat, which might not be there in tariq and sabil, right? Tayyip. So, the ulama have mentioned that sarat is يعني, uh, distinguished from or is, is distinct from other uh, words that, uh, that also give the meaning of a path or a way in four things. Sarat is wasa, it's vast. It's a, it's a pathway that is vast. Sahl, it is easy. Musul, it, it, takes, you, it, يعني, it takes you to the destination. Right? Musul, يعني, it makes you reach the destination. It leads to the destination. Right? And it's not something that, is, that, is, that, that has a dead end. Right? Leads to the destination. And Masluk, it has been taken by 
other people as well. So these are, these are the khasayas, the distinct features of sarata. These things make sarat distinct from tariq and sabil. So it's wasi, it's sahal, it's musul, and it's masluk. So this is why this is, in particular, uh, the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the path of guidance is, uh, the word sarat is used for it mostly because of these four distinct meanings that are not there in tariq or in sabil. <coughs> Okay, why do we mention uh, the Surah that is Mustaqim? Even though after, after one ayah, we're going to say Surah Al-Ladina An'amta Alayhim. Yani, and the next ayah, we're going to say the way of the ones whom, upon whom <coughs> you bestowed your favor. So why do we have to mention that it's Mustaqim? What is the faida of saying that it's a straight path? <coughs> Even though this is the path of the Anbiya and the Rusul. This is the path of the Prophets and the Messengers. <clears throat> Why do we have to describe it as Al-Mustaqim? What is the faida that we gain from this? There is a, a big faida that we gain from this, that this is this path of the Anbiya and Rusul, the teachings of Anbiya and Rusul, the teachings of the Deen, they are the correct and right criterion for Haq and Baqil. They are the perfect scale to measure what is right and what is wrong. And hence, we find people who don't believe in Allah, or people who do believe in Allah, but they don't really pay attention to, or yani, uh, pay heed to the religion and the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find them confused about things such as morality, what is wrong and what is right. They are confused. Because there is no scale, there is no criterion for right and wrong. Yes, yani, a few years ago, to uncover your legs was immoral. Today, yani, to uncover your whole body is not immoral anymore. So where do we stop or where do you draw the line? What is the criterion of right and wrong? The criterion of right and wrong is known through wahi. To guide you to the right path, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in his hand, and it's according to his judgment, that we know what is right and what is wrong. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in our fitrah what is right and what is wrong, generally speaking. But to specifically know which things or where to draw the line, that must be that can that that can't be known except through wahi, except through the revelation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So ihdin al-sirat al-mustaqim, we learn by mustaqim that the path of the Anbiya and Rusul is the right path. So be confident in what in your the teachings of your religion. This is the right thing. If your religion says that, let's say a <coughs> a person who commits zina after marriage uh, and after after he's a uh, uh, not a thayyib anymore, uh, uh, he is supposed to be stoned to death, that is the right thing to do. Because this is a sarat al-mustaqim. Be confident in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the license to this uh, way, to this law, that this is the correct and the right law. So don't be ashamed of it. Don't be afraid of being expressive about it. Wadah. If... Uh, if, if our religion says that a person who commits shirk is a person who is yani, evil, that is how it is. This gives us, yani, this is also, and this also refutes those people who are trying to bring different religions close to each one another, and they say, everyone are good, every, every religion has goodness in it, and all people, all good people will go to Jannah, you know, uh, regardless of the religion, all, all religions lead to Allah. No, they don't. There is only one Surat Mustaqim, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As-Surat Al-Mustaqim, the straight path. There are no two straight paths. There is only one straight path that leads to Allah. And what path is it? That is the path of Islam. That is the path of Islam. There is only one straight path, and that is the path of Islam. As-Surat Al-Mustaqim. This is the only way that is deserved of being described as Al-Mustaqim. And all other ways 
are not mustaqim. Sorry. They are not mustaqim. If I offend you, يعني, or, or يعني, follower of other ideology, if I'm offending you, I'm sorry. But that is the truth. That is the, the truth that all other ways, there is only one straight path. All other paths are not mustaqim. طيب. Uh, خلاص. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next ayah. Sarat al ladina an'amta alayhim. Inshallah, I'll try to just finish this and wrap this up in uh, 15 minutes. Please, Nina Ta'ala. Sorry for يعني, taking very long time today. Sarat al ladina an'amta alayhim. The path of those upon whom يعني, you bestowed your favor. طيب. An'amta alayhim. Now, you are describing this straight path. You're saying this is the path. Of those upon whom you يعني, showered your favors. Five. Now here, the first, uh, first question is, who are the ones that are meant by الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ Who are the ones upon uh, whom is the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's another ayah in Surah An-Nisa that we could use for this, to, to explain this ayah. If anyone remembers that ayah, وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ Anyone? The one who uh, obeys Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then these are the people who are with the ones upon whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, has bestowed His favor. Whom are they? مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّيقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ The prophets, the Siddiq, what is Siddiq? We'll come to that later. وَالشُّهَدَاء, the martyrs, وَالصَّالِحِينَ, the pious ones. وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا What is Siddiq? Siddiq refers to someone who, uh, who affirms and believes in whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told him about. Siddiq, and it comes from Tasdiq, and Tasdiq means affirmation. To affirm all that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. So they don't find any shame in their, they don't find any haraj. They don't find any haraj in their, in their heart with regards to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has revealed. Right? They don't find any resistance in their heart with, with regards to what, any discomfort, any resistance in their heart with regards to what Allah has revealed. These are the people who are Siddiqun. And Siddiq, uh, يعني also, يعني some ulama mentioned that this, these four categories, where do the ulama, uh, uh, يعني, uh, which, which category in, uh, includes the ulama? The Siddiqun, the category of the Siddiqin includes the ulama because the ulama, because of their uh, knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are the, uh, the, the people with who, whom, uh, who, who affirm the, the uh, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and uh, affirm the commands and affirm the uh, uh, Wahi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most because they are the closest and the most knowledgeable of Allah's wahi. So they, they are the people with the less, the, يعني, the least of discomfort when it comes to uh, affirming what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, commanded. <coughs> okay, Ulaika, so Alladina an'amta alayhim means prophets. Tayyib, Al-Ahza. Prophets and <coughs> those who affirm all that comes from Allah, all that comes from Allah, shuhada, martyrs, and pious people. <coughs> now, the next question with regards to this ayah is <coughs> and this is the last ayah, alhamdulillah. Uh, if you could notice here, we are attributing or we are mentioning the subject, that is the fa'il, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon whom? Surat al ladina an'amta alayhim. Upon whom you have bestowed your favor and your mercy and your grace. We are attributing this fa'il, this word to Allah, upon whom you have bestowed your mercy and your blessing and your grace and your. <coughs> but when it comes to غير المغضوب عليهم, we don't say that الذين غضبت عليهم. 
the ones who <coughs> upon whom you were yani, uh, uh, upon uh, with whom you were yani, angry <coughs> or upon whom you uh, yani, your wrath was uh, uh, upon whom your wrath befell so why the difference or why uh, are we differentiating between an'amta and ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim why are we differentiating between an'amta here we are attributing this to Allah and here we are not attributing this ghadab, this wrath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're just saying upon whom uh, yani, a curse had incurred or a, uh, the ghadab, the wrath was incurred. We're not mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here also we are saying those who uh, yani, uh, went astray, right? those who uh, became misguided. So here also we are attributing the fi'l, the word to themselves. And also here we are not mentioning Allah. But when, we, when we're talking about an'amta alayhim, we are mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why the difference between the two? Because the result of the bad deeds is come like this, and the, all the good deeds is up to Allah ta'ala, whatever he gives you, more than what you did. But I for the it. for the bad deeds, he says it is mimak tasabu. I'm getting uh, yani what you're trying to yani say here, alhamdulillah. But inshallah, this could be more clear, inshallah. Uh, in Amtasi, Allah is the one who yani bestowed his favor upon these people, right? Ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim, Allah is the one whose wrath was incurred upon these people. So, alhamdulillah. Or, or, or yani, uh, the, who incurred uh, the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyip? But here we're not mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the question. The answer to this question is that when we mention good things, al-ashya al-hasana, we attribute them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. An'amta, your favor upon us. What does Ibrahim alayhi salam say? He says, الذي خلقني فهو يهدين The one who created me, then he is the one who, who's gui who guides me. وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينَ He is the one who feeds me and provides me with drink. وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ And if I fall ill, and I, if I fall sick, he is the one who uh, uh, heals me and, and gives me the cure. He is the one who cures me. So when he is talking about the disease and illness, He's not referring it, but he's not attributing it to Allah. Why is this? This is adab ma'Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the manner of talking and attributing things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The things that are negative or are considered negative are not to be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the manners or manner or etiquette of talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is this so? Because, let's take the example of Ibrahim. If, if Ibrahim had said, if Allah, if Allah causes me to fall ill and sick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of his actions are khair. All of his actions are goodness. And all of his actions are full of wisdom. And all he does is due to a wisdom. Tayyip. He does it for a good reason. So when you only mention that Allah caused me to fall sick, it is the, the negative connotation that this fi'l has will be associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the thing that you want to avoid. That the negative feeling that one gets, the negative connotation that some words or some uh, things have, they should not be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why shouldn't they be attributed to Allah? Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that particular action or that fi'l, he did it for a hikmah. For a, there, was a great, there was great wisdom behind it. And all of his actions are, all, all of them are goodness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of his actions are evil. None of his actions are evil. But when the evil things, when you attribute them to Allah, that negative connotation suggests that Allah is the one, Allah is doing some evil act. Allah is doing some evil act. And you want to avoid that from being attributed to Allah. 
So out of adab and etiquette with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't attribute it to Allah. Because Allah, when he caused you to fall ill, he did it for a hikmah. And there was great hikmah behind that. Maybe because you would do tawbah. You would yani, return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you would uh, beg, uh, beg to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, uh, to, to, to cure you. So this, this was khair. There was lots of khair behind it. But when you, say, when you say, Allah caused me to fall ill and sick, all of this khair is not mentioned in this word. In your expression, your expression is void of the khair and wisdom, of the khair, يعني, of the goodness and wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had in his action. Which is why you don't attribute evil things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the etiquette of talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, maghdubi alayhim, wrath, or, uh, or being, uh, يعني, uh, يعني Allah's anger befalling some people, this seems something that is negative. So it is not attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wadih. Dalleen. Isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the one who, uh, who uh, the one who caused them to uh, يعني, become misled and become misguided? Yes. Allah so, and, uh, everything is in Allah's hands. But we attribute misguidance to these people themselves. Because when Allah causes someone to become misguided, that is for a hikmah. And that hikmah cannot be mentioned or it is it becomes hidden when you say Allah caused me to become misguided in this expression the hikmah of يعني, that was there behind this this great wisdom that was there behind this action of Allah is not mentioned and hence negative things and negative thoughts will be attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and associated with Allah to avoid this evil things al-makruha are not attributed to Allah only the beautiful and good things are attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only the beautiful and good things are attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why the jinn, in Surah Al-Jinn, if, uh, uh, if anyone remembers, uh, they say, وَأَنَّا لَا نَدْرِي أَشَرٌ أُرِيدَ بِمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَمْ أَرَادَ بِهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ رَشَدًا We do not know if anything evil is intended for those in, on earth. Yani, the jinn use passive voice. Passive voice omitting the subject. They did not say who intends this evil. They did not mention it. We don't know if any evil is being intended for the people of earth. Or their Lord wants goodness for them. So when they talked about, when they mentioned goodness, they attributed this fail to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when they mentioned evil, they use passive, uh, they use passive voice to avoid attributing it to Allah. Why? Because to avoid those negative thoughts that might be associated with Allah, that negative connotation, that evil, the word evil or sharr has. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be associated with Allah because when Allah creates sharr, he does it for lots of khair. He does it for khair and he does it with lots of hikmah. And when you only attribute sharr and do not mention the khair and hikmah, you're associating evil thoughts and evil things with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are failing to mention the khair and the hikmah because you're ignorant of them. So because of your ignorance, you avoid attributing any evil to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Five. And uh, that's pretty much it. Okay, khalas. Uh, Final thoughts on Surah Al-Fatiha. What, uh, and it, just an overview of the whole surah. What is the best thing that we learn from this surah? And if we just look at the surah as a whole, what is the thing that the surah teaches us? What is that the surah teaches us? Looking at the surah as a whole. Uh, the etiquettes of dua. The etiquettes of dua. How to, how to pray to, how to invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How to uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you first praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you express your need. The, yani, the, the, the amount uh, or you express the, how, how much you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is you whom we seek help from. I'm totally dependent on you, O oh Allah. And then you start asking whatever you want. Uh, this is the etiquette of dua. Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Express how much you need him and how much, how dependent you are upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then ask for your haja, for your need. And one last question. How many times do we read this dua in, in a day?
more than 17 times. 17 times at least. طيب. Okay. 17 times. Okay. Surah Al-Fatiha. Is it obligatory to read it or is it optional? Obligatory. Obligatory. So Allah has made it obligatory upon us to ask him for hidayah 17 times a day. Okay. Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it obligatory upon you to ask him for food and drink 17 times a day? No. No. طيب. This gives us uh, and this suggests how important hidayah is for us. Something that you and that Allah made it obligatory upon you and your salah is invalid without it to ask him for hidayah 17 times a day. Look, look at how much you need hidayah. You're not asking Allah 17 times for food. You're not asking Allah 17 times for drink. You're not asking Allah 17 times for clothes. 17 times for hidayah. That means that your need of hidayah is more than your need for food and drink. That means that your need for hidayah is more than your need for food and drink. And because upon hidayah depends an eternal life. If we don't get food and drink, what happens? A temporary 60-year life, 70-year life gets spoiled, yeah? You struggle in that sort of life. And, and, and a life that is 60, 70 years long. But if you don't have hidayah, you will be punished forever. And this goes on to show yani, how much hidayah or how much in need of hidayah we are. And remember that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, yani increases the a need uh, of a human for something, he increases that thing in amount as well. For example, if humans need oxygen a lot, then oxygen has been made free by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's really available everywhere. So, uh, humans need water, water is easily available. The, the, more the, thing, the more you need something, the easier it is, uh, uh, the, more, uh, or easier, uh, the, the, easily, the more the easily available it is. So if, if, you, if you are really in need of hidayah, that means hidayah is available to you. All you have to do is just strive a little, work hard a little, open the Quran, read the Quran, reflect over it, read the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu and ask Allah for hidayah. All of this is abundantly available for you. Nektafi bihada, we'll stop here inshallah. And inshallah next week onwards we'll start Surah Al-Baqarah bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك